Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Hey, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage of Red Hat Summit 2018, live in San Francisco, the Moscone West. I'm John Furrier, the co-host of theCUBE. Here this week as a co-host analyst, John Troyer, co-founder of Tech Reckoning, a advisory and community development firm. Our next guest is Jim Whitehurst, the president and CEO of Red Hat. We have the man at the helm, the chief of Red Hat. Jim, great to see you. Thanks for coming on, taking yes. the time. Great to be here. Thank you for, for hosting with, with us here. So you're fresh off the keynote. You got a spring in your step. You're pumped up. <laughs> Red Hat is really really getting accolades across the board, so congratulations on the big bets you've made. You Thank guys you. are looking like geniuses. We know you're super smart as a company, so congratulations. Either that or yeah. lucky, but we'll <laughs> take it either way. We um, are well positioned. Analysts love your opportunity. Um, we're reading in the financial analysts out in the web but saying you know, the expanded market opportunity for Red Hat is looking really good. You got um, infrastructure applications and management all kind of coming together. OpenShift is the centerpiece of all this and the cloud scale world is moving right to your doorstep. This is really the big uh, tailwind for you guys. Um, by design or like, I mean, how is it all coming together? Is it a master yeah. plan? Well, yeah, I think it, it, two things. So one is because we don't bet five years out on technology and write a technology stack to get there, you know, that's not our model. Our model is to engage in communities and when those communities get popular enough that we think that there's value in a supported version, then we offer the supported version. Now, if you flip that around and think about what that means, it means we're never wrong with the technology bet because we're not providing a product until it's something that's already highly successful. So we didn't offer OpenStack until it was successful. We weren't offering a Kubernetes offering until it was popular. And so I think that's one benefit. We truly work bottom up in communities. And then secondly, I do think uh, we benefited from the fact that we've lived in the old traditional enterprise world for 20 years, helping them migrate from Unix to, to Linux. And so I think we understand the old world. And the one kind of spin we put on the technologies is we have a sense of, okay, for a traditional enterprise, it's great there's all this cool stuff that Facebook and, and Twitter and others are doing. How does that apply to this set of problems? I think we uniquely have a foot in both worlds, so we, work and develop with you know, the Googles, Facebooks, Twitters, but we really think hard about how those technologies apply to a traditional enterprise in the context and legacy migration and all the other issues that they face. And you had years of experience dealing with the practical nature of getting support to customers, but you got to bring that new shiny new toy, but make it right for the customers. Yeah, exactly, and I think one of the reasons OpenShift, you mentioned that, you know, it's our Kubernetes platform, is uh, getting so much attention is we have, instrumented and architected it to be able to run traditional stateful enterprise applications. And so, yeah, you can do uh, cloud native, you know, 12 factor, blah, 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 on it. But importantly, you can run your traditional application suite on it. And so one of the reasons I think you see so much momentum and so much interest in it is we're trying to span both worlds and really thinking from an enterprise IT mindset in terms of their problems and saying how do you apply these technologies to make it work. So we're not sitting here saying you need to go do this, you need to adopt Google's practices. What we're saying is here's great technology we think you can uh, leverage to kind of help you as you migrate to this new world. You guys got some clear visibility and I think it's interesting in the container trend and Kubernetes, really good timing for Red Hat um, with, the, with what's going on. And so two things we were commenting on our open today was, we got the interoperability of multiple cloud options going on with Kubernetes and containers with respect to legacy applications. And then you got the cloud native scale for all the new stuff. So the old model in tech was kill the old to bring in the new, but now you have a new model where you can actually keep the old legacy, containerize it, right. while building new functionality all within software that you guys are enabling. So this is, is, a, is a kind of a breath of fresh air for a lot of people in the industry on the enterprise side saying, oh okay, I can still use my stuff, but yet build new scale with cloud and on-prem and have choice. Exactly, and it's not just use my old stuff, it is also leverage my existing people and their skills. Recognize in app, the app dev world, most people aren't developing in a stately, stateless cloud native way. And if you look at the traditional enterprise developer, they on average have four hours a month to do continuing education and new skill development. So the idea that you're going to flick a switch and say all my new applications are going to be in this new model is crazy. Plus, so much of the work you're doing is around your existing estate. Really providing a platform that says you can develop net new with the skills if once you have those. You can take your existing people and take them on a journey 
versus like this big chasm that you have to get over as you think about both your applications and skill sets and build over time. I think that resonates really well with enterprises. Uh, Jim, I really like the keynote this morning. Uh, it was a very customer focused, not technology focused. And a lot of these keynotes lately have been fear based. You know, change or die, right? right. Your, your company's going to go out of business. You had a more positive vision and uh, the stories there were, were very good. A lot about time to market, time to value, uh, some nice stories. I, I, I was joking, I, I think, you know, flying cars would be great, but I know I'm in the future if T-Mobile can help uh, car makers update the apps in the car within a couple months using OpenShift, right? That's Indeed. the future as far as I'm concerned. But um, you had this really nice framework of, uh, you know, instead of pre-planning everything and, as, as IT is wont to do, uh, you talked about configure, enable, engage. Can you talk a little bit about that framework and, and kind of your prescription for up-leveling the organization as it, and its um, resiliency, basically, as it, as it, as it hits the ground uh, running? Yeah, sure, and so I think you, you, you put a, 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 a really good light on this idea of so many technology companies are out there kind of almost fear-mongering around digital transformation. And what's happening is organizations around the world fundamentally how they create value is changing. And it's all gotten listed under this moniker of digital transformation. But what it's basically saying is, the future is very unknowable because the world's changing very, very fast, it's ambiguous. You're likely to have be Uberized, I mean that's a word now, orthogonal competitors coming in different ways. So your normal way of, let me do a five year plan, let me prescribe a set of initiatives and organizations and job descriptions to go attack that, and then execution becomes about compliance against that plan, that model no longer works when you don't know the future well enough to be able to do that. And so, rather than just pick on that and say, ooh, you should be scared, you should be scared, what we try to do is say, hey, Red Hat's lived in that world forever. Like, we had no idea that Kubernetes was going to be accessible it is, and we don't necessarily know where it's going to be five years from now, but we know if we build the right context, it will develop the capabilities required for us to meet our customers' needs. And so applying that same model that we've seen in open source, and frankly, we see in a lot of Web 2.0 companies, we get asked over and over again, hey, you provide me great technology, but help me contextualize this broader problem because the problem that everybody has is, I need to be able to move more quickly, I need to be able to react to change more quickly, and I need to innovate more effectively. That is not a SKU. If that were a SKU, we would be a $100 billion company, right? That's not a product you can buy, it's a capability to build. And so, the model we talked about was, planning gets replaced by configuring, right? So, you don't know what the future's going to be, but you know it's going to change, and so configure yourself for change. Prescription, or this idea you lay out all the steps that need to happen for people, in an unknowable world, you can't do that, but and it gets replaced by enablement. So how do you enable your people with the strategy, the context, but also the tools, uh, decision support tools and information to make the right decision? And execution becomes less about compliance and more about engagement. So how do you engage your people in your organization to effectively react to change going forward? And so this model, it's a very open source-ish type model of from plan, prescribe, execute to configure, enable, engage, I think encapsulates a lot of what organizations will need to, be, to, to go do to be successful. I got to ask you a question on the community piece. I think that's where you guys have been successful with the community. It's a great way to be successful, you don't A-B test anything, you just look at what people want and right. you deliver on it. It's the, this, you, this feedback from the community. So I got to ask you, modern, modern open source, as we look forward in this next wave, what is, in your opinion, the key dynamic going on in open source? How is it changing for the better? What are you guys looking at? Because you're seeing a lot of younger people coming in. Um, open source is a tier one citizen in the world. Everyone knows that now. I mean, when you guys started, it was you know, Red Hat and there's an alternative and now you guys have made that market. But now we're looking at another generation. Microservices, cloud scale. Open source has become the right. model. You're seeing a lot more commercializations projects maintaining openness, some productization going on at the same time. Is there some key changes that you see that people should be aware of or that you guys are watching in how open source has evolved? Yeah, so, I mean, two changes. One, kind of a, a broad role of open source, and then I'll come back to then how it's consumed. So, you know, you're exactly right. 10 years ago, and certainly 15 years ago, open source was about creating lower cost open alternatives to traditional software, right? And that's what we did, yeah. you know, Linux looks a lot like Unix, it's just lower costs and more flexible, et cetera, et cetera. Over time though, as the big Web 2.0 companies adopted open source as a model, you get this move so more innovation was coming from users than from vendors. So it's like big data, take that as an example. Big data exists not because of open source, it's because a ton of large IT
users like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Yahoo, et cetera, had these big data problems, and rather than going and finding vendors to, to, to solve them, they solved them themselves, they did it in open source. And so, you see this model move from vendor-led to user-led, and it's just like the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution, the winners were the machine tool manufacturers, so people use the machine tools. Yeah. So I think we're, we'll continue to see this happening where the majority of innovation is happening in, from users, done in an open source way. Now, the flip side then is, I think there was a sense 20 years ago and even 10 years ago among the zealots that it's a big war between open source and proprietary. What we're seeing now, I think developing, you see this with a lot of the partnerships we announced is, Open source will be embedded across virtually any technology platform, right? You can't use your phone, you can't get money out of a bank machine, you can't do a search, you can't do any of that stuff without using a lot of open source software. Doesn't mean the whole stack has to be open. Now we're, we're all open and we're advocates yeah. for that, but you're seeing Microsoft embrace, you're seeing IBM embrace, and so broadly I think you will see a larger and larger share of the technology stacks that people use today be open source yeah. and that'll continue. I mean, I think the proprietary thing's pretty much a, a um, dead horse at this point. I mean, open has always won, open is winning. Um, but also to your point about earlier making decisions in the community, there's a risk management benefit on this user-led. You're taking away the risk. Oh. There's all kinds of risk management being done for you. There's no longer operational things that cost money, like managing releases. <laughs> you, can, you can actually get great operational benefits as well as risk management for what to do. Well, exactly, because these platforms, it's not, let me look at three vendor solutions and say which one do I think looks the best. You actually can say, what are people using at scale? What's worked well? And unless you're a bleeding edge adopter, you actually can get the observations of how people are using it and what's working and what's not. And I'll tell you, from a vendor perspective, it's great. When we release a product, we never say, ooh, does the market want this? We're not releasing the product until after the market's already adopted the technology <laughs> in a community way, in a, in a pretty significant way. It's great data, certainly game changing. I think it's going to be written up as a, a kind of a new dynamic that's going to certainly be, be referenced in, in, the, in the history books. I want to get your perspective on, on the going forward basis. I know you guys are public companies, you really can't talk about the numbers, but in looking at some of the financial analyst reports recently on you guys, there's a quote I want to get uh, your reaction to. This analyst said, software containers look to be much larger opportunity for than rel ever was, and if Red Hat can become a leader here, it will set the company up for many years to come. So there's obviously some people saying, obviously the container thing's pretty big. Right. Um, how are you guys talking to the marketplace, both the industry market, financial market, and customers around the containerization opportunity? How has Red Hat look at that? How has, how has this, as you as the CEO, talk to that trend? Because they know RHEL, RHEL's right. had a track record, but now you got containers. What's the order of magnitude? How, what's the mental model people should take to think about containers? So, I mean, you can answer that in a couple different ways. So let me start off with the, the size of the opportunity. So as applications go from these monolithic services, or applications to containerized microservices, that architecture is very, very different. And in the old world, you'd have an operating system, and then you'd have a whole set of tool chains and management tools and all these things to manage these applications, right? Well, in a containerized world, you expect the platform to manage that for you, right? And so, in the old world, which still exists and is growing for us, but in the Linux world, we provide the operating system on which the application ran, and then you had different management tools, you had application performance management, CMDB, all this stuff that worked around that, right? You expect your platform to do that now. So if you think about the value we have in OpenShift, which is our platform, it's doing that telemetry, it's doing uh, patching, it's doing uh, all, a lot of the automation that was happening before. So there's a lot more value in the platform. And so like a two socket server running RHEL versus a two socket server running OpenShift, there's like an order of magnitude price difference. And our customers aren't looking at it saying, oh my God, that's expensive. They're actually looking at it like it's cheap versus the whole sets of tool change and management tools and other things they were doing in the old world. So fundamentally, the container platform has a dramatic amount of value. Now, then from a Red Hat perspective, and I'll bring up a, another company, um, it's a little bit of a competitor, but you know, VMware, uh, did a great job of becoming the default management tool company around a virtualized infrastructure. Well, why? Because in the shift from physical to virtual, they were there first, and they kind of built a 
paradigm for managing that. Well, in this world going to containers, containers are Linux containers, so we're there first. And so, working to drive that paradigm, I think we can be a significant share player in this, these uh, new container uh, platforms. And honestly, if you look out in the market, the clouds have their individual cloud offerings, which are fine, we actually can span all of that. So if, if you have any hybrid structure at all, we have by far the best solution to address that. And so, so I think analysts are assuming we're going to be successful at a much higher value add and therefore more expensive product, if we get our rel share of that, you know, it's an order of magnitude larger And that's the cloud economics in play right there, because with that scale, you're talking about, okay, OpenShift's taking on a new role for the multi-cloud, for the large scale, you know, horizontally scalable synchronous services that are coming online, like microservices. Exactly, exactly. Well that also implies a cloud scale partnership and ecosystem strategy, right? I was, uh, your customers on, are you know, deploying OpenShift on clouds like Amazon, Google, big partnership with Microsoft announced uh, this week, as well as a big IBM partnership. Can you talk a little bit about how Red Hat appro is approaching that, that cooperation and competition and, and what, what parts uh, you'd like to keep on, on Red Hat versus what, where you're going to end up partnering. Yeah, so, you know, we, when you think about the fact that we sell free software, right, you got to think hard about the value proposition. And one of the value propositions we've always believed in is we create choice for our customers. So running Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we're geeks, we could talk about all this value associated with it. For many purchasing departments, the value is always, when it comes up for, an, uh, for a hardware refresh, I'm not locked into one vendor now, I can bid that out because every vendor works on RHEL. So if my application runs on RHEL, I've unlocked choice at that layer. So that's built into our DNA, it's not just the value our software adds, it's the flexibility we provide customers. So when we look at these new generation platforms, we really strongly believe we can add a lot of value by abstracting whether you want to run it on premise, on a server, on VMware, on any of the public clouds. By abstracting those away, we're giving our customers choice at the core platform layer. So part one is to make sure OpenShift is a first class citizen and runs well everywhere. And so for our customers then, you know that your application will run anywhere. For our ISV partners, to take IBM for instance, because IBM has announced all of their software running on OpenShift, that can now run wherever OpenShift runs, which is, by the way, everywhere, without IBM having to do a lot of work. So creating this abstraction layer, huge benefit for someone like IBM. So you can now run mission critical IBM software anywhere you want to run it. Uh, via OpenShift. So, real value to a partner like that, obviously value to us as it drives, drives workloads. Now, one of the other things that we've seen a lot is that people have gotten used to cloud, is they're really saying, hey, I love OpenShift, this is great, but honestly, you manage it for me. Uh, that's one of the things I like about cloud, so I love the idea of this abstraction layer, but I don't want to build my own management uh, or, or my organization to be able to manage this at scale, so you be my service provider. And so we built that in a small way, so we have OpenShift Dedicated, which is an offering that Red Hat engineers run, uh, that runs on Amazon. But we wanted to make sure our customers had choice, and also they could choose other vendors they want to work with, and you know, Microsoft obviously has a lot of heritage in enterprises, and so this, uh, this uh, opportunity for enterprises to be able to run OpenShift at scale on Microsoft, fully managed and supported jointly by Microsoft and Red Hat, we think is a really phenomenal offering because we just don't have the scale to build out the capabilities to, uh, to even to meet the demand that's coming in right now for us to offer a managed service of OpenShift. And you guys are also doing some work, just to point out, and again, I want to get your comment on, to help with the licensing issues. I know there's been some announcements where you guys are trying to get um, some, some, some more support for folks who are dealing with some of the licensing issues when expiring, and so we had your Associate General Counsel on talking about some of the you know, version two, version three, you know, grace periods. Uh, what does that mean for customers? I mean, what's, what's the internal motivation behind that? Is it just making it easier? Well, you know, this whole idea of licensing being an impediment to customer success, I just find horribly bothersome in the technology industry. And so we've always tried to strip that out for Red Hat. Um, and it, with our customers, and now trying to say, well, Red Hat's big enough, it can have enough influence broadly. How do we try to be, be more influential in communities? So certainly nothing in the open source licensing arena, not just for us, but for any vendor, gets in the way of customer success. And I think that's so important, this idea of 
the artifact of protecting IP means you create lack of flexibility for your customers. I don't think anybody wanted that to happen, but it's happened. And so anything we can do to help kind of tear that down, we're working to do. Well, congratulations on all your success, and I know that when, we see, when I hear words like de facto standard, it gets my attention. You see Kubernetes role OpenShift's doing. We're envisioning a huge wealth creation, a new value creation market coming online pretty quickly. Um, you guys are doing a great job, congratulations on that. Awesome Thank work. You. Thank you. Final question for you, I know you got a role, but you guys are also growing, I know your teams are growing. How do you maintain the Red Hat culture? You get more people coming on working for the company. Um, what's the strategy? You give them the Kool-Aid injection? You, uh, you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta bring them in, assimilate into the uh, open source ethos that you guys built and are expanding. What's the, what's the plan of getting all these new, new employees and new partners on board with the Red Hat way? You hand them the red pill and the blue pill and they better <laughs> re take the red pill. No, in all seriousness, that, that is, I always say it's, a high class problem, but it's still a problem. You know, we do grow roughly 20% a year. Take into uh, account even modest attrition. You know, roughly 25% of the people at the end of the year at Red Hat weren't here at the beginning of the year. And so when you think about a culture-based company, and I spend a lot of time talking about our source of advantage is a capability that's tied up in our culture, that's critical. So from how we think about recruiting, over half our, uh, our employees come from employee referrals. When I say nobody knows a Red Hatter like a Red Hatter. Um, to the way we do onboarding, which people laugh, they, you walk out of onboarding, you still don't know how to get a computer, but you have been indoctrinated in the power of open source, to the way we do checkups along the way, the way we use video and a, a whole bunch of, of, of things to do that, because it is critical, it is who we are and what allows us to be successful. You got a lot of red hatters out there who left the company, started companies, they come back in the fold for acquisitions, so that's always a great, great sign, and uh, we love what you're doing. Obviously, Cube, we're open, we love, open always is winning, and it's the new standard, so congratulations. Well, thank you for having me, it's great. I appreciate you being here, participating in the summit. All right, Jim White, CEO of Red Hat. We're here at theCUBE live coverage, day two of three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Check out all the coverage on thecube.net, siliconangle.com, and wikibon.com for all the action. I'm John Furrier with John Troyer. More live coverage after this short break. Stay with us, we'll be right back. <laughs>